So what did the Indians do? The Indians in these movements basically started to talk about a new kind of state. Depending on who you ask, uh, they're going to talk about a plurinational state, a multicultural state, an intercultural state. This has been a constant of indigenous movements across the region. These demands continue to be central in the struggles of indigenous movements, and they provide a framework of reference to other more specific demands. While in some cases, indigenous peoples have been unsuccessful in incorporating plurinationalism into the constitution, for the most part, uh, countries have witnessed the, 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 the reform of the constitutional frameworks in the last few years, recognizing the multi or pluricultural um, making of, 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 uh, of the country. Um, in other words, they're basically, for the first time in the 1990s, acknowledging that, that these are plurinational states, that they are nations within the, uh, within the nation. That sounds like Harper. <laughs> and not that I'm proud of. OK, so while the demands for a plurinational and intercultural state do not stop here, they often give coherence to an anti-capitalist project. So in other words, this, this idea of the plurinational state doesn't necessarily mean or doesn't translate uh, to an anti-capitalist project. It is not. But movements have been more, let's say, successful. And I quote, I air quote the idea of success. They have been more successful when they frame their demands along the lines of a plurinational state than when they just confront the system as an anti-capitalist struggle. And this brings me to the very last point. I know it's been 40 minutes, so I'm going to use five. Can I use five minutes? Sure. And that's it. Um, and this is it. This is the paradox. This is the second set of challenges. Why do we feel more comfortable with Indians when they talk about the plurinational state than when they talk about an anti-capitalist project. I think it has to do with the transformation of the state. While indigenous movements have been often seen as a reaction or resistance of the implementation of liberal policies as sort of the first, it probably was the first thing that got me into it. It's like, who is resisting neoliberalism the best? Oh, okay, Indians are. Let's go and study it. Um, it is rather the conjunction of political liberalization and the process of economic structuring and state reform that have provided also opportunities and incentives. Huh, so it's not resistant. The neoliberal state does two things. It gives you these policies that you resist, but it also gives you opportunities. It gives you the chance to participate in it, to participate in the main direction of, of, of where the state is going. Nowhere. Is this clear, clearer, more clear? I never get it right. Then in the tensions in the language of autonomy. And that's the key to understand the paradox. Autonomy, it's a beautiful word for neoliberals in the same way that it's a beautiful word for indigenous people. It condensates all of their struggles for centuries in one word, autonomy. The major selling point of neoliberalism has been autonomy as well. Here's the difference though. Well, the neoliberal state attempts to construct a concept of multicultural autonomy as universalistic, individualistic, and ultimately another form of the consumer choice touted by globalization. Indigenous notions of autonomy often require something different. They require that autonomy takes the form of collective, relational, intercultural and centrally concerned with territory, self-governance, and control over resources. So very different contents. The word is the same, but the expectations are different. So in broad terms, what makes a state a neoliberal, a neoliberalized 
state to borrow our um, Veronica Shield phrase. I have to give her credit because really. she's the one that has been working more in the idea of the neoliberalization of the state. What does that mean? Well, in broad terms, the neoliberal reforms involve a transformation of the relationships between the state, civil society, and the economy. So we, here we're getting into something else. We're not saying that the neoliberal state is that state that articulates or passes privatization laws, that uh, decentralization uh, that opens up the foreign trade and so on and so forth. We're saying it's something more. It changes the relationship and the expectations of the Latin American citizens. The particular outcome, however, depends, of course, on local circumstances of the neoliberal state. So we're talking, we should be talking about the neoliberal states. Neoliberalism expands as we know it, although not, in the, not according to the conditions of its choosing, of course. Indigenous movements are always part of the landscape of the social actors that shape these conditions in which the neoliberal operates. But I want to finish with the idea of the cultural dimension of the neoliberal state. We say it's a cultural project because it carries a new discourse and practices, of course, on citizenship, which in turn includes indigenous citizenship. In other words, citizenship is succinctly defined the relationship that between a subject, each one of you, and the state. That's what citizenship means. In, in traditional liberal parlance, it's that connection is given by rights. This is what connects you to the state. And this is how the state connects to you, through rights. The right to free speech and all those beautiful things. In, in the case of indigenous citizenship in Argentina, what we are witnessing, according to some, and I hear I always take Charlie Hale's uh, notion of the Indio Permitido, the permitted Indian. I think that's the best metaphor to explain this tension. The notion points at the paradox of the apparent political openings for identity-based claims on the one hand, with the criminalization of extreme indigenous mobilization, when their demands are associated with violence and conflict. In other words, multicultural states limit, in practice, the recognition of indigenous rights in a framework that has more to do with their neoliberalization which is basically connections to global capitalist interest, and with their discourses and frameworks of constitutional rights. So it's all nice and, well, you know, Indians wear their traditional customs, their, their dance, their dance, they eat their food, um, and we respect and we glorify their customs and traditions. But the moment they start to take over a territory that they, they believe is their ancestral territory, they become the Indio no permitido. While in general the anti-capitalist stance is clear, in practice indigenous movements, and this is sort of rephrasing what I said earlier, focus on a list of issues that tend to be seen more immediate, such as the defense of their territories they either occupy or use to sustain their livelihoods. This, of course, help, uh, even happens even within this sort of pink side of leftist governments. In conclusion, I'd like to remind you of the four main points that I made. First, the re-emergence of indigenous peoples as relevant political actors in Latin America. Second, this re-emergence is the result of previous experiences of popular struggle, new political opportunities made possible by the re-democratization and return to electoral regimes, and finally, as a resistance to structural adjustment policies. Third, the re-emergence of indigenous peoples translated into a deep political impact in Latin America. This impact challenges limited visions of liberal democracy, the extent and impact of structural adjustment policies, as well as the notion of the homogeneous state. Finally, the fourth point is that these impacts, however, need to be contextualized in a broader context of neoliberalization of state forms that radically alter the boundaries in which citizenship, indigenous one included, is conceived and transformed. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I hope so. <laughs> and I, I, I kind of throw a lot in there. Maybe if, I, I, if you allow me to use one of these, oh, this one, just to give you a sense of. This one gives you the four major, the four main points, I guess, right? So I don't know if that's right. Mm -hmm. I have very like uh, kind of different questions. Um, okay. I myself don't know a lot about indigenous people in Canada. Can you give us like a peek of differences and similarities of if sure. there are any indigenous movements or if, mm -hmm. like, what are? Well, the first question that usually I get when I um, when I actually go to study the title that makes me yeah, look bad. But you know, when when I the first time I visited the. Um, the Zapatistas were visiting the Yaqui tribe in, in northern Mexico, and I, you know, I was almost like a teenager meeting Justin Bieber for the first time. Or Marcos came over. Oh, I'm really excited. Um, and uh, more so than when I saw the Pope, right? It's like, okay, the Pope is, is nice, but uh, Marcos is like. Uh, and then when I when I start to work with the Mapuche, the first kind of question that I get is is. Um, uh, how do the natives live in Canada? Well, you know, what can you tell us about it? And I said, the reason I'm studying you is because I like to travel. I have to get out of the winter and keep working with my, you know, with Latin American, with, with Latin American uh, uh, groups. Um, but no, in um, in I think, Erin, hi. I I I, I I I recently started to become. Uh, more more aware of the connections between uh, natives in Canada and Latin America, and by teaching indigenous peoples courses, I get to do that as well, sort of alongside with, with students. So the, the the kind of concerns are very very similar. The kind of paradox between um, or, or the tension between you know recognizing uh, in the legal system the rights of indigenous peoples on one side and natives in the case of Canada, when they're constitutionally recognized. Um, and, and, and the practice of the, of, of, of the neoliberal state, which is basically a state that lets the extractive industries of logging, of mining, of, 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 of uh, dams uh, construction um, happen without any sort of serious look into the, into the input of the affected um, indigenous communities, it, it's, it's, almost, uh, it's almost astonishing because you would think that, that even in countries like Canada with more, let's say, formal resources uh, within the democratic system, you would think that, that natives would have a better shot at it, but they don't. Um, so in, in, that, in, that, in that sense, of course, there have been um, uh, the, the, the level of violence in recent, recently um, perhaps has been, um, uh, has been, you know, different, but now we are, uh, it depends which countries we compare, but uh, many Ontario natives would, would say that their situation is worse than in many of these other countries, such as Bolivia, when now they're kind of running the country, their own affairs. Um, so there are parallels. Uh, indigenous peoples in Latin America are always willing to understand the plight of natives in North America because they uh, they see it as uh, you know as an example in a way, but 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 this is the other thing. I think there there is more interest in natives in Canada to understand the Zapatistas and Latin American indigenous struggles than the other way around. I get that sense, although much of the literature always assumes that the South always looks at the North for 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 examples, and I don't think this is the case too much. 